at last, the film Scam is uh, being released in a restored version. And the story behind the film Scam, a sort of crime thriller, uh, is quite fascinating. And I'm speaking to the writer-director of Scam, Cameron McCulloch, and the co-producer and editor of Scam, Nathan Hill. Welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Not to mention Nathan's one of the stars of the film as well. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> hey, and so are you. So are you, Cammy. No, that was someone else. That was someone that was oh, that like someone else two years ago. Yeah. His name is Barry. It's not me. Oh, Barry. Sorry, I forgot. That's right. <laughs> talk about deleted scenes. All right. Let's let's <laughs> let's talk about Scam. Now, Scam was first filmed in 2001. Tell yeah. me about that initial filming and what happened to the film? It is quite an incredible story. Um, well, so we filmed it actually in between my second and third year of uni. Um, and it was kind of a spite piece because one of my lecturers told me I'd never make a feature film, even though I'd been making films since I was 13. So I kind of went away and made the film as a kind of like an F you to, to one of my lecturers, you know, and I'd always wanted to make a feature. I'd made like 50 minute, you know, 60 minute films and, you know, which are all written and directed and edited between two VCRs. Um, and then with this ah. one, it was sort of like, um, it was like, you know, I did, we just made Radio Samurai the summer before with Nathan. And um, and I kind of saw the kind of DIY way that Nick was doing it. And I thought, well, I can do that, but on a smaller scale, because I couldn't afford film. So we show on DV and just thought, well, I can, I can, I can write something. And then we, we kind of ended up just doing it. And then we, we made it and we went into post um, and we're going along pretty well. And then there was a fire at a house and uh, it kind of got lost for a long time. Um, after that, I, um, I had some of the tapes. I had like half of the tapes. So I went back and rewrote the script into something completely different with what I had and then started filming that, but it just wasn't the same. So I kind of just put all the tapes in a shoe box and uh, kind of left it at that and just kind of like wiped my hand and said, no, you know, you know, I'll make a feature film again. And then every few years, a couple of tapes would turn up in the mail, you know. Um, oh, we found this tape, <laughs> found that tape. And it kind of became this thing where he'd just send me the tapes when he'd find them. Um, and I kind of just chucked them in a box because I was kind of done with the project. And they kind of sat in that box for years. And then during COVID, um, Nathan was like, I'm doing a doco. What have you got of scam? And I said, oh, I've got a shoe box. I'll take it. <laughs> Um, you know, and then I went to my parents' house um, and found the actual like tape logs as well, which actually yeah. covered in my blood. It's hilarious because um, we, we we would log as we were shooting, you know, and it was like half the half the the uh, covered in like all these like blood and mucus and all sorts of weird stuff <laughs> from, from the um, from the different squibs and stuff we had. Um, and then I said, "Here's the logs as well." And then Nathan, I'll I'll put on to you to what happened after that. Yeah, look, it was it was awesome because um, there was that during COVID. You know, I, I guess I was sort of looking at it as um, an early retirement plan. You know, it's like what I would do in retirement, which was sort of go back and because I was in the in the in the kind of early stages of putting together a, a retrospective doco on all the films that I'd made and collaborated on. And Scam was always sort of like a monkey on the back. It was unfinished, and I sort of you know felt that camaraderie with Cam because we'd you know, we've known each other for so long and uh, having that lockdown and the time to really just um, have a crack, you know, because I think a couple of people had tried to and not really licked it. Um, but I understand Cam's humour. And, and uh, so I just rang him and, I, was, and I, was, I said, well, look, you know, you know, thanks for the tapes and do you mind if I have a go? And the assemble edit, you know, came out of that. Um, credit to Cam though, Cam's done the finessing and he's done, you know, what you would call the online edit. I really just kind of set it up um, and did the grunge work. But I, I will say I've never enjoyed editing so much in my life. I was literally at one point where I was on the floor, hysterical in laughter. And my, my partner was even like, what is going on? Because I was editing in her basement. She's upstairs and I'm just screaming with laughter throughout all these rushes. And some of the funniest stuff that, I've ever seen. It was it was so much fun. 
Well, it, it, I found it such an interesting film and what a process to go through. I mean, over 20 years, for goodness sake. I mean, it's just incredible. So, Cameron, I must ask you, what was the impetus or the thinking behind this somewhat tongue-in-cheek uh, sort of uh, crime film? Uh, what was your planning behind it? Yeah, well, I kind of grew up with, like, some of the characters are based on real people, like knackers, fingers. Like, a lot of those guys are actually based on people that I actually know who are friends of my family. Um <laughs> and I kind of like wrote characters that based around some real people. I've always loved the action genre. I've always loved the comedy genre. And I always like this. And it is, it, it is, a, it is a piss take of a film, but it, it's a piss take that kind of takes itself seriously, you know? Yeah. So there's like lines that are, that are kind of, uh, that are kind of, that have that sort of piss take. But I, I do love the genre. Like I grew up on Hong Kong action cinema. I grew up on John Woo, True Hark. All of those like amazing filmmakers, um, and I kind of just it was basically a love letter to those kind of films, and I just really like kind of enjoy, you know, the genre. I I just think that like action and comedy like work so well together. And also, can I jump in there and say that yep. during the filming, you know, the movie was kind of described as the true romance of Melbourne because it had so many actors in it, and so many actors, not to mention Kesty. Marassi's debut, technically, but also um, all these other indies and uh, actors coming out of the gates and, and some of which have gone on to really illustrious careers. Um, when you look at people like even Eleanor Handley, I believe, you know, doing well in New York, um, and Ian Rooney, who's, you know, a local legend, he's in all sorts of stuff, uh, and also the late Paul Javier. I mean, this was, a, a, you know, a really big indie wave at the time that, that Cam's at the helm of. Um, and credit to him. And I even remember coming in doing Gunman and being kind of gobsmacked at just how much firepower and how much testosterone there was on the set. And I was like, I don't know how he's directing this. It, it, like at the time, it really was quite epic. Um, and, uh, you know, don't undersell yourself on saying it, that, that Rad Sam was bigger because for me, like Rad Sam and Scam were kind of even keeled. They were, they were just as big. They had their own things going on. Um, and it was a really exciting time. Uh, so I'm so glad to be a part of it. Yes, and and your career too has taken off. So after that, after that film, so, <laughs> so we have so many careers that have uh, stemmed from scam. I, I I like that. It's fantastic. So let's talk about casting and let's talk about Pesty and uh, and Carter Doyle, Matt Norman, Scott Gooding. I mean, it's it's a really and yourself uh, a, a great cast. Tell me about getting these people in for this low budget film. Yeah, well, I originally went out to a whole bunch of agents and we had we had a we had like we had a fair bit of interest. Um, and then they heard the budget and that interest dropped dried up completely. Like all of these really good actors. <laughs> um, and like all of them were like, yeah, we're really keen, we like to do it. I mean, I didn't tell them that I was like 20 years old, yet you know, that I'd barely, you know, <laughs> I don't give a shot stuff on, you know, H like not even HD, I'd, I'd shot stuff on VHS. Um, but like I'd, I'd had a I'd had a you know, I'd been growing up making films. And so I've sent it out to all of these, you know, people and all of them were like, we love it. It's amazing. And then all of their agents said no. Um, it's crazy. So then we, uh, then I just kind of like, I, I, I'd worked with a lot of the people on Rad Sam. I'd worked with a lot of the people on my, with my uni films that I've been working, that I'd, I'd shot on actual like film and stuff. And then the rest of it, I just like, I just set out a casting net um, to just a whole bunch of, there was like a, I think it was like Filmnet was the website at the time. Oh was, Yeah. <laughs> of websites that had access to actors and people just kind of would send me their CVs. Like, like um, one of the guys who ended up being in the film drove himself down from Sydney. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which was Mark and who, oh. and he, and, and he was just like, yeah, he was so confident. He was like, he came in and he goes, yeah, I'm going to get this part. And I was like, yeah, really? And then he read and I was like, yeah, you're going to get this part. <laughs> it was that good. <laughs> and just a lot of the actors, like, you know, like Matt Norman, and like I'd worked with Paul before and I'd written the part specifically for Paul. Um, Matt was just someone who came in and just nailed it. Um, Kesty at the time was a friend of, um, was a friend of one of the other lead actors. And like, as soon as she read, I was like, yeah, that's it. Like within the first audition, I knew she was going to play Kim. And with, with Carter, with everyone else, it was just like, you know, everyone just came in and just brought their A game. And to their credit, they weren't um, they weren't afraid to work with like a twenty year old who looked like he was thirteen. <laughs> hey, Cammy, what about Tom Wren? What was the story with Tom Wren? 
he was just another one who just who just he just answered the ad and came in oh, and wow. just, and it was it's just everybody who who was like who weren't people that I knew just answered mm. the ad and they and I I for the most part like the auditions like like you know we we saw a couple hundred people all up mm. and you know I just and it was good because like we shot we shot really quickly we shot like twelve days so um it wasn't mm. like you know, a long process. Everyone was in and out. Most people were in and out in two days. And who does, who doesn't have two days? <laughs> yeah. That, what an incredible story as well. And and as you said, uh, Cameron, you've made lots and lots of films. Um, uh, I read, but uh, this being a feature film, etc. Tell me about your process in terms of uh, directing all of these uh, uh, these actors and of uh, getting it all shot in the uh, twelve days. Uh being naive and self-confident at that age <laughs> it, it's completely <laughs> that it was just, i was like yeah i can do this um, and it, it like after that it took me a long time to make another film um and because uh, mainly because of life takes over you know you get a job you work you know things happen um and it was it was just complete you know i can do this i know what i'm doing let's just go out and shoot it and i didn't have time to think i just had time to react and it and do it and we just did it and that's the thing is we had our crew it was really really small well oiled crew who and we just kind of just we just kind of just made it there wasn't any thinking about like i didn't have time to even worry about you know ego <laughs> <laughs> was there any prospect at all in making this feature film of getting funding from uh, from any bodies at all be it uh, film victoria as it was then or uh, from um Screen Australia, although it had a different name in 2001 and so on, because um, uh, with with your heritage of making so many short films, I would have thought you might be uh, eligible for funding. God, no, I couldn't even get the VCA. Like, you know, they were just like, <laughs> like, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm outcast. Like, I, 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 we didn't even think about that. We, we just, I just thought I need maybe six, seven grand to make this um, and I can make it on you know, like the way that I make my film because I'm the smell of an oily rag, you know, same as, you know, Nathan, he's like independent make, filmmaker as well. And and I kind of just thought I didn't even bother trying to get funding because for one, no one's going to give a 20 year old, you know, a million bucks to make a film or even a hundred grand to make a film, you know? Um, so I just thought yeah. I'd do it myself. And then, you know, my mum did the catering. My, uh, you know, it was just sort of like, it was, and like I just pulled in favours and just was like, it's a family affair and, Everybody who worked on it kind of knew what they were getting in for, that it was just going to be a fun shoot. You're going to be in and out really quick and, you know, and then we're done. And I think I think the other, you know, the other thing to, that I want to sort of throw in there just to, to kind of jump in on that as well is um, I've always seen Scam in, in an era, in a period of time where, you know, there were three feature films back to back, you know, which was Radio Samurai, Scam, and then there was Razor Eaters, and, uh, and obviously Nick Levy, you know, our good friend and co-producer was on all three. And, and in retrospect, the way I kind of see it now, it's interesting because you're right, Peter, like, you know, the um, Screen Australia didn't really come to the party. But if you look at Radio Samurai, it, it, the way I look at it is that Nick kind of discovered me and then Cam discovered Kesty and then Shannon Young discovered Richard Cawthorn, you know. So, you know, there, there's powerhouses coming out of these indie films and I feel like, perhaps the indie stuff needs to get a little bit more recognition or, or praise for its work because it's very hard and there's not a lot of people, you know, putting their, their life on the line to do it. So it really is um, a rarity and credit to people like Cam as well that, that have made these films without the government support and in the process discovered stars. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's, it needs to be celebrated. Well, Look, I've never actually had funding for anything anyway. Like yep. all my films that have done really well. Like um, I've never actually had funding. Um, look, I've, I've, I'm working on stuff at the moment which we're putting up for funding. But um, but that's a lot of it's out of just that I'm like I'm just gonna just go and do it. You know, I I, I kind of like I don't want to wait six months, twelve months to be rejected for you know something <laughs> that I'll make. You know, um, because I, I mean there's something I'm writing at the moment. Like it's too like doing some TV stuff and other stuff that actually needs budget but i'm also working on a short film where um which completely i can do i mean might have to kickstart some money but it's sort of it's a sort of thing that like if i can do it myself i will always do it myself because 
like you know no like there's just so many people in the in the bread line waiting for that funding right mm. and it's just like and ha- and the like rather than just sitting there going oh mm. yeah i didn't get it this time and then another you know six months you, down you know you're time. you're absolutely right and you know the guy that the guy that's um that won my one underground film festival one of the first years he made the um the the movie the magician i you know i think of him um what was his name Oh God! I think it's Scott Ryan. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, Scott Ryan. Um, he also yeah, made the TV and, show. And and, yeah. and I think of him because he was around at the same time as we were all coming out of the gates. And I just read in the newspaper recently, just going off what what Cam said, was that you know he's finally got some funding. And I think it's taken like twenty years. You yeah, know, he did and the TV show with yeah, um, Nat turned, um, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's finished now. And now he's doing a feature or something else. But that took twenty For twenty years. years to get that it's too long. Yeah. It's too long to wait. You and you and I, you know, we're 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 impatient. We would we couldn't do that. It's too long. Mm. No, I appreciate that. I absolutely. So, uh, Cameron, I'm also intrigued in writing the story or the screenplay for Scam. Were you influenced at all? I mean, we're looking now at uh, 2000, 2001, by any particular films or filmmakers. Definitely. Um, well, of course, John Woo, um, Robert Rodriguez. Um, like there's definitely um there's, there's a there's a great indie film I'm trying to think of the name of it um called the not safe El Mariachi man. uh and we, no this it's called the Safe Man it was like this indie yeah. comedy called by John Hamburg which I thought oh. was really great um and we we kind of um but there's a couple of throwbacks to that movie anyone who knows it will know the throwbacks um and yeah mainly it's like Hong Kong cinema um as far as American cinema goes it's really just Rodriguez um really don't like Tarantino so not Tarantino um uh like I like they're my main influences really and and of course my favorite director of all time is Wong Kar Wai who's another um that his films are more romance drama films but like um not a lot of American influence okay now in 2021 the uh the now uh, edited um, full version of of Scam uh, was released uh, at Monster Fest. I notice, and you received a nomination um, uh, at Monster Fest. That must have been uh, quite great for both of you. That uh, at last the film was getting a proper airing. Yes. Yeah, and I mean <laughs> Monster Fest absolutely adored the film and uh, were really excited about it as much as we were, and they. Um, they called it the rescue mission, which I thought was cool. Um, and we had we had such a good screening, didn't we, Cam? That was a full house. Um, uh, you know, one of the best Q and As I've ever been involved with. It was incredible. It was a lot of fun. It was just hard to try and remember from like twenty years ago because <laughs> 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 it was just like it was. It was like I'd, I'd I'd kind of washed my hands of the film until Nathan kind of you know took it took it under his arms and and made it to what it was. You know, I kind of like I'd kind of like. You know, it was in a shoebox in a cupboard. Mm. <laughs> oh, the, I, I can see a documentary behind the scenes about making a uh, scam and uh, and restoring it as as another as another possible film. So uh, I'm I'm quite intrigued, Cameron, because uh, uh, as you've already alluded to a number of times, and I've, I've read up that you've made so many short films. And what drove you to being a filmmaker in the first place? Um, when I was a kid, I, I got into acting um, and I enjoyed it, but I was more interested in what was happening behind the scenes. So I um, I had a friend, um, like a friend of my dad's at the cricket club had a camera and I was like, oh yeah, um, can I borrow it one weekend? And it was like a VHS camera. And me and a mate went off, made a film, we were probably about 11 years old. We At that time, we were in-camera editing. Um, so pausing, you know, you only had like, a minute to get your shot before you'd get a glitch um and then we just like make all of these films which are like like we did like the terminator of aspendale which was where I grew up. <laughs> and all of these we made like these short films and we just started making and then we started we, we had a he had a vhs that had audio dub so then we could do the video and then audio dub like a um like a soundtrack underneath it things like that so we kind of just like we just started making them and every night after school every weekend from like probably about 12 13 onwards me and a friend would just be making films and that's all we did for like you know like i mean i, I played sports well but mainly it was just 
you know, making films and, you know, creating like, you know, getting getting a pack of 20 sparklers and crushing them up and then creating like a big smoke bomb and all sorts of things and trying to make, do what we did. Because where we lived, there was a whole bunch of like empty blocks as well. So we could really just, you know, run amok. And no one actually ever called the cops on us, even though we did some really dodgy things. <laughs> ah, the good old days, they were wonderful. <laughs> it was the 80s and money, so, you know, you can get away with Exactly. And and Nathan, when did you get involved with Cameron? Well, because Cam and I met on Radio Samurai when I was acting co-lead and he was on crew and we bonded on set because that was an intense 32 days straight, one of the most gruelling shoots we both had ever been on. Um, and then when I heard that he was uh, going to direct um, a film of his own, uh, I auditioned um, and... Uh, yeah, got involved again, and but and, but we've stayed in touch, and we've got a lot of mutual friends. So, <clears throat> but it wasn't until kind of you know we got to the lockdown when I when I saw that little window of opportunity, because um, I'm one of these guys, and I've said it before, I don't like messy accounts. If I've been involved in something, and 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 I can help, I will. Um, and I wanted to help, you know, get that one over the line. But I also want to throw out a thanks to um, Les at Bounty because he's also been an ambassador for the movie and now that we've got the digital you know distribution and also the i'm just going to show off we've got the dvd and mm. we've also got the blu-ray mm. um you know so you know it's again you can see cam's backdrop and the the post is amazing the 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 uh the reincarnation i think is amazing so i just want to thank um, bounty films because you know they got behind us and bounties to me is one of the last standing kind of real um uh, Melbourne and Australian distributors that all that all back indie films. It's a, it's not not a very easy thing to do anymore to to release a film unless it's gone through those channels we're talking about with Screen Australia. So yeah, thanks to to Bounty as well. Yes. Yeah, no, and it was yeah because like we had a bit of interest in distro, but like the what Bounty offered compared to some of the others was just like way better. And it just just the fact that they were local, mm. they got mm. kind of they got the humor of the film that they got the fact that it wasn't supposed to be taken seriously like it's it's not a film that is like you know there's nothing serious really about the film mm -hmm. you know it's like even just the characters themselves they're just a tiny bit off caricature not enough to be caricature but you know almost caricature you know because like i think one of the like you know i love like the naked gun kind of films i could never make one of those films because they are so hard to make properly because to do like that kind of like comedy is like the the it's like it's impossible to write unless you're like an amazing comedic genius. But a piss take is a little bit easier to do because you know you can get away yeah. with almost you know running that territory you know but not quite. Well, well done on that. Yeah, not that kind of humor, and I like that because I I do think that like it's a very Australian thing like that yes. kind of tongue sort of like and it's the thing is like a lot of like. I'm not sure how overseas audiences would see it if they'll see it as, you know, if, if they think, if they take mm. it seriously, it's going to be like, well, you're in for a bit of a, you know, shock because, you know, this film cannot, could not be taken seriously by, by anyone. Pam, did you get inspired by like two hands? Was that your, is that your sort of vibe? I, I like the film, but that was, that was kind of, that kind of had some kind of serious undertones, mm. it, you know, about the brother and all of that. I mean, I love, I think that's a real like as far as the debut go, debut film goes, that is an amazing debut film. Like, mm. and this is an amazing piece of writing. Um, but I, I was never thinking on that level because I didn't have that money. So I wrote mm. on the level to the money that I had. You know, yeah. if like, you know, I, I always write either within my budget or you know, if someone else is if it's gonna foot the bill, then of course it'll be a lot bigger and a lot more grand scale. But anything that I'm writing within a certain budget, I never kind of, you know. You, you swing for the fences in different ways, you know, you know, you, you, you go for it in like, I think that with, with the humor and with, I knew we had three days to shoot the action stuff and that was it and it ended up being two days. So like, we just kind of had to like get in what we did because like the, the action scenes, we shot one, that one with the big explosion outdoors. That was like a half a day shoot inside the actual, like the main shootout at the end, that was one day, but it was one day rigging as well. And then there was a jewelry store, which actually that was footage that was lost. Uh huh. And were finding locations easy? Yeah, yeah. I, I worked at 
I, I wrote it around faces that I know. So I worked at the bar and the bar was had an upstairs downstairs. So it doubled for both bars. Um, the jewelry store we'd actually shot in. It was a jewelry store out of Frankston. Um, we actually shot a short film in. Um, literally everything else was like, um, I worked at the reception center, which doubled for the police station as well. Um, the factories, everything that we shot in was, it was written around places that I knew I could get for free. Uh -huh. Again, well done. And and at last we have the uh, the finished product, which is which is fantastic to see, um, and available digitally and on DVD and the Blu-ray, which is uh, which is excellent. Uh, uh, more power to Australian films. I always keep saying. So, <laughs> so Cameron, subsequent to uh, um, Scam, um, tell me about uh, what other films you made and what you're working on currently. Uh, yeah, so so I made a I made a, a zombie film called Home, which end up uh, became part of a, a feature film um, called Zombieland, which is like a compilation film. Um, after that, um, and that did really well, like we screened all over the world with that. Um, then I did a filthy puppet comedy, I guess you could call it, <laughs> 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 the Tea Party. Um, and that went really well, you know, that took me to Fantastic Fest and a whole bunch of other festivals all around. Um, and then I made a film called Sissy Boy, which it didn't go as well. I like it, but it just didn't resonate with the audience. That was, I guess, a product of hubris. I thought I was better than I was, and it just kind of showed me that, you know, sometimes you just gotta, you know, try things, swing for the fences. But when you when you when it when you don't hit it, just move on to the next one, you know. Um, and you know, I, I did like after I did like forty eight hour films, like one of those forty eight hour film festival films. Um, and um, and I've worked, on, I've done some doco stuff since then, and my, mainly after that, I've been writing a lot. Um, and having having you know, getting married, having children. Um, life, life happening as well around that. Uh, with with the other films that I've got going at the moment, um, I'm working on. I'm writing um, two TV shows at the moment. One is a children's TV series. One is a drama action series. Both of them are actually action series, but um, one's more the kids kind of um, kids one. Um, and I've got a whole bunch of feature films that I've written that are ready to go. Um, and I've got a short film that I'm writing at the moment, which is a musical. Ah. What a d diverse range of films! That's fantastic, <laughs> and shows. Yes, that's that's great. And, and uh, Nathan, what about you? What's what's happening on your front at the moment? Well, I guess you know I've, I've sort of um, got into a good position where I where I'm able to co-produce and, uh, and and spread myself a little bit wider. You know, sort of when you're doing your own stuff all the time, it gets a bit uh, not monotonous, but um, uh, I, I like to, um, you know, sort of shake up the mould. So uh, it was great sort of jumping in and helping and can with Scam. And now I'm actually going to be helping um, other filmmakers finish another feature film called The Deck Collector, which is coming out through Bounty as well. Mm. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm helping to co-produce that. Um, and I'm in the middle of some, some re-release stuff. So, yeah, very busy. Um, but my, my next big film is the Alien Love film, which, is, um, which I've just finished. So um, trailers and stuff, you know, soon to follow, and I'm sure, I'm sure we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait and look forward to all of that. That's fantastic. Right. Look, I'm so, I'm I'm so glad that uh, Scam uh, is available uh, for people to look at, and and the history of it is so interesting. Um, but just to conclude, I'm, I'll ask you both the last question. I love asking all filmmakers. Um, I'll start with you, Cameron. Perhaps um, have you seen anything else of late? That has impressed you. Ooh, okay. Um, <laughs> God, what have I seen that I've really enjoyed? Um, look. Lady Terror. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I actually did enjoy that movie. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to think. Um, people are going to hate me. I actually didn't mind Rebel Moon. I actually thought it was fun. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed that. Um, I've been watching. Um, was it there was the new TV show that um uh Britt Marling has done um a murder at the end of the world that was phenomenal uh, and that made me go back and rewatch the OA which is another amazing piece of filmmaking um I watched Saltburn recently I quite enjoyed it I, I didn't I, the, the only thing I I found about Saltburn was is that you know I love like Lynch Cronenberg you know French new like the French new wave horror and stuff and everyone's like this is the most shocking film I've ever seen and I was just like waiting for the shock and didn't get it. It was a solid film, but it, I didn't get any shock out of it. 
Um, but I thought I thought the performances were all really good, and it was a, it was a fun movie. I, I didn't find it shocking in any way, though. I had nothing about it. You know, maybe I'm just desensitized from you know too many French horror films. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. And what about you, Nathan? I've actually been gaming a lot more of late, um, but uh, I'm I'm really anticipating. The, well, I saw Killers of the Flower Moon because I do love um, the Scorsese DiCaprio, um, you know, kind of pairing, um, double team. But I'm I'm really looking forward to the the finale of Cobra Kai season six. That's what I'm hanging out for. Yeah, I got <laughs> quite 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 obsessed with it. So <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Fair enough. Look, we've been speaking to Cameron McCulloch, who's the writer-director of Scam, as well as Nathan Hill, who's the co-producer and uh, editor of Scam uh, with Cameron. Thank you so much, both of you, talking with me about Scam, and I hope now the uh, full release version of the film does well. Yeah, please go Thanks, out and Peter. rent it or, you know, watch it on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much for talking with me. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. See you later.